G'day everyone and welcome again to the chat. The bloodstock sales season is, is in full swing and this week coming up we've got the English Modern Premier Yearling Sale and joining me today is the Victorian Bloodstock ma Manager. He's also an auctioneer in Simon Vivian. Good morning Simon, how are you mate? Good morning Ben, I'm very well and looking forward to the sale. Obviously a very exciting one but also a very sad one because it'll be your last one before you um retire after a long time in the industry. How many years is that all up? Ben, I've been uh, I've been in the thoroughbred industry, in the agency industry for 44 years now. So it is, has been a pretty long innings. And you're quite right. It, uh, this will be my final premiere. It won't be my final sale. I'll still go to Sydney and do the Easter Yelling sale in Sydney in April. But this will be my final one at Melbourne, uh, which will be 16 years of being with English, which has been a wonderful 16 years. I've got the catalogue here. I've been having a bit, a bit of a look. There's a lot of first season size in there, but more importantly, what are you most looking forward to with the 804 watts catalogue for this week's sale? Ben, I think when, uh, as, an, as a sales agency, for me, the, probably the most important thing that I can satisfy myself with at the conclusion of a sale is to have a very, very high clearance rate. If you've got a clearance rate of you know 90% or thereabouts, what you've been able to do is you've been able to bring your vendors and your purchasers together. Um, if, if it's if it's slanted too much in one side, you know, if the vendors are wanting too much money and the buyers aren't prepared to pay, you've got a poor clearance rate, that's disappointing. And then if the if the buyers are walking away saying to you, as we stole horses, then that's not good either. So the reality is that we want to be able to create a very fair marketplace and the best judgment of a, of a fair marketplace is to have that very high clearance rate. So I think that's probably my number one priority. But then, of course, subsequent to that, um, we love seeing seeing good results. We love seeing horses make good money in the sales ring, Ben. And ultimately, to go on and and, uh, and see them perform on the racetrack, you know, whether we get another Black Caviar, another Ole Kirk, another September run, you just look forward to getting those really high-quality racehorses on the track. And uh, since you started in Bloodstock back in 1977, what have been some of the significant changes you've noticed across the sales and, the sales and also just the industry in general? Well, I think probably the most significant change has been, well, it's probably two, um, one, one links to the other. The first thing is the, the use of computers um, where... When I started, we used to sit down with 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 uh, the Australian stud books and the turf registers, and we would sit down and we would actually handwrite all of the pedigrees. And it was almost like doing an apprenticeship. If you can imagine being an apprentice plumber and an apprentice electrician, you you start with the the, the rather menial jobs, but they become very important. They become a great foundation. Um, over the last forty four years, we've gone to a situation where. Uh, the pedigrees are now basically coming straight off of a computer. If you said to me that you wanted to have a look at a pedigree of a certain horse now, I could pull it up on a computer and email it to you and you, we could be talking about it in 30 seconds' time. So the, the actual skill of doing pedigrees that, that long-handed way um, has been has been lost, and I, I suppose to a degree it's meant that it's harder for young people to actually get actively involved in the business because that, that was just the, the great apprenticeship that we had to do. Um, the other part, of course, that's happened is, uh, which is, a, a, again, a, a further step on from the computer aspect, has been the advent of these online sales, and they've been quite remarkable. Uh, I think Inglis, it's safe to say, was a was one of the absolute forerunners, um, much to uh, to the delight of, of our of our CEO and managing director in Mark Webster, who was the, the foundation behind all of that with, with Inglis. He created a fantastic platform with our IT boys, and I think now it's admired around the world as probably one of the best online auction sites that you would ever find for bloodstock. So, you know, those two things have been two massively significant changes in our thoroughbred industry when it comes to sales. So you say you used to do them all by hand. It obviously sounds like back in those days, it was definitely an art form too, wasn't it? In sorry, in an art, an art form in terms of writing them by oh, hand. Yes, it was. Look, it was quite an interesting process because we still were working with the same size catalogue. So when you would handwrite a pedigree, you had to try and assess how many, you know, how many lines it would actually be. So what would occur in those circumstances, Ben, is we would handwrite the pedigree, would then be sent off in a handwritten form to a printer. The printer would then typeset it and then send us back a proof. And from the proof, we would sit there and, and edit the, 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 the catalogue page. We would, we would drop out things that were no longer significant. We would drop off to have to shorten the page and things like that. So it really was quite skillful. Um, we would sit down. There would probably at times be eight or ten people writing pedigrees, and you might write maybe four or five pedigrees in a whole day. So you can see with a catalogue like 804 horses for Melbourne Premier, we had 803 in the classic sale. So 1,600 horses would take, uh, the pedigrees would take a long, long time. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting exercise for sure. Just back on those first season sires we've got going through the ring this season, which one has you excited? I'm very excited. I'm buying Pending. That's my favourite one that I've seen so far. Look, I think we all get incredibly excited by the Impendings and the, and the Highland Reels and the Almanzors. They are 
they are a fantastic batch. I mean, we've got over 20 individual first season size, Ben, and with each new year of first season size, we look forward and hope that there's going to be um, a really high quality vintage crop. If we look at the existing size of the first season size of two year olds, which is the the draft of capitalist extreme choice, flying arty, shalar, etc., uh, it would appear at the moment to be an outstanding draft. That looks like a really high quality bunch of first season size, which is for, terrific for the industry. And now when we have this new but new draft of horses coming through. Um, I think it's it's so exciting. I'm, I'm with you very much on impending. I think he's a he's a great looking horse. He's a magnificent walker, and all of his progeny are, are great walking horses as well. But the other horse that I've been so taken with because I've seen a number of them is a, a first season side based here at Swettenham Stud in Victoria by the name of Highland Reel. He was a phenomenal racehorse, but he's leaving a really good quality product on the ground. And whilst perhaps they're not going to be um, really precocious two-year-olds, I think that you know, back in two-year-olds and into their three-year-old days, we're going to see some pretty exciting times with the Highland Reels as well. So they're probably two that really excite me, and as much probably because they're both based here in Victoria. And I don't, thought, I don't think we saw the best of Highland Reel when it came to Australia and racing the Cox Plate, for example. But hopefully with the progeny and they're staying in Australia, we will see some, um, hopefully some, some success. Yeah, I think that's a very fair call. I, when you have a look at his record, um, he was he was sort of well. Some people would look at him and say he was basically a staying a stayer, but I think that he had more speed than that. And it would be interesting to have been able to turn the clock back and have a horse like Highland Real race in in Australia, where I think he was had the capacity to probably be um, a CF4 stakes or a Doncaster type horse. You know, a seven furlongs or fourteen hundred meters, a sixteen hundred meter sort of horse. So whilst he was able to stretch out, he was he was a very very tough genuine fair dinkum racehorse and uh i think that we are we are very very blessed to uh to have him standing here in victoria tell me a little bit about david coles who you worked under when you first started he's a legend of the um thoroughbred auction industry uh, mr coles was a was a phenomenal person he taught taught us so many things you know not only did he he uh, teaches about the, the way of writing pedigrees but he actually taught us um one of the great things great lessons in life and that was work ethic uh, there was one of the great things with David Coles was that he would never ask any member of his staff to do something that he wouldn't do himself. And I can still very much recall one day that we were actually selling at the Melbourne Showgrounds back when Coles Brothers shot, sold at the Melbourne Showgrounds as well as in Adelaide at Wayville. And mm-hmm. somebody made a joke to, uh, to Mr. Coles about there being some uh, some droppings in, in his horse box. And Mr. Coles charged straight over and picked up a rake and the person was absolutely uh, well, amazed but embarrassed by the fact that he'd almost intimidated Mr. Coles to go and muck out a box. But that was the sort of man that he was. He was a, a great leader. He taught us um, so much about work ethic. We would have to work, you know, when I mentioned those pedigrees, uh, if we had a, a time frame to get them done, it wasn't a nine to five job. It was a, it was a, an eight till 10, eight, eight in the morning till 10 at night. And uh, he would leave and go away to meetings. And all of a sudden we'd see you know, his, his car headlights coming back around the corner at 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. He would sit down and do do race form for us or write out the pedigree cards and, and then start to rack on tour about certain stories. So he was a, a legend in that way. And of course, he was probably at the time I would say the finest bloodstock auctioneer in Australia and certainly one of the finest bloodstock auctioneers in the world. And he was the man who gave me the opportunity to get up on the rostrum um, many, many, many years ago now when uh, when I was invited to have a go at, at auctioneering. And he said to me, so I think you might be okay because you've got a voice like a foghorn. So I was lucky enough to uh, get a crack at, at auctioneering and it's been one of the one of the great joys for me in in the thoroughbred industry is being able to stand up and 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 do some adding up like that. And you talk about opportunities. You've got an able, you can almost say able assistant, but he will be taking over from you when you move on. When you call it a day in James Price, he's a familiar face to everyone in Inglis. It's great to have James back. Of course, he was the some some years ago Inglis initiated a an internship, and James was our very first successful candidate and whilst the internship was only meant to be a 12-month um, internship and just to learn a little bit about the thoroughbred industry I think the everybody in English was, was was so impressed by by James that he was offered a full-time position which he accepted in our Sydney office and then ultimately he came down and joined me here in, in Victoria as my 2IC and was a great right-hand man and a great supporter um, he was given an opportunity at the conclusion of a Melbourne Premier Yearling Sale a couple of years ago to join Woodside Park 
and Mark Rosethorn, and he's done a great job there uh, overseeing the, the state career of, of horses like Written Tycoon and, and Cable Bay and Rich Enough and these sorts of horses, Toast and Stardom. Um, but then with my uh, with my decision to uh, to hang up the gavel, uh, it's been an opportunity for Inglis to approach James and ask whether he would like to return. And I'm very, very fortunate that someone like James will be able to transition into the seat that I'm currently in, um, knowing that a man who already knows and understands the thoroughbred industry, understands the Victorian marketplace, the Victorian clients, understands the staff that are already here at, at Oakland's, I think it's going to make uh, make life very simple for me. Um, James will be with me for about one month before I hang up the uh, the boots, and uh, it'll be a great transition. And I'm looking forward to uh, working that month with, with James and handing over to him, but also to be able to see him uh, progress and develop as a, as a manager of the Victorian operation. Are there any particular memorable lots that you've auctioned over all those 44 years um, that went on to become champions, and you look back and you're like, wow. I remember seeing it go through the ring and it just really caught my eye. Look, we, um, we I don't, I'll be honest, I don't do a lot of going back over um, catalogues. I know that um, when a horse like Ole Kirk steps out and performs as he has done with great distinction in Group 1 races, mm-hmm. you go back and have a look at your notes and I was very pleased to be able to see that I, I actually auctioned him, but that's not that's not something that really sticks in your mind when you're going back and looking. The one that obviously probably was uh, the the horse that was probably important for me was was many, many years ago in, two, in the year 2000, I was doing some auctioneering work for New Zealand Bloodstock and I was fortunate enough just to be on the rostrum at the time when Don Eduardo went through the ring and he obviously made $3.6 million, which nowadays not that that's that that sum is not overly commonplace but um, back then to have a horse make a million dollars was uh, was extraordinary so for him to make 3.6 million was was something that was probably um, quite life-changing he was in the ring for some seven minutes and i don't know how many 40 odd 45 individual bids or something like that somebody once counted uh but he was he was important because at that stage there'd been a number of very expensive yearlings that perhaps hadn't been quite as successful on the racetrack so he went into the freeman camp and the Freeman brothers trained him to win an Australian derby. So I think I was probably really delighted to see him win a Group 1 race. It was important for a valuable cult like him to win that Group 1 race and then ultimately go to start. So he does stick in my mind. Um, I don't – I can remember looking at – for example, Black Caviar, I remember seeing her as a foal up at Gilgai and working with her right through with the team up at Gilgai at that stage. Um, and I remember seeing her here at Oakland's Junction. But, of course, when she goes through the ring and, and Peter Moody buys her, no one has any idea that um, that she's going to be in, in a being what she, what she ultimately developed into. So um, as much as I'd love to be able to sit back and, and say that I you know clearly recall her going through the ring, Peter Hegney was the auctioneer at the time. I was standing behind Peter at that time. And... Um, you know, it's a massive buzz to be able to go back afterwards and sit back and say, look, you know, we had the, the pleasure of being able to sell these champion racehorses. And your enthusiasm for Melbourne Premier and the Victorian Breeding Industry Week really comes out whenever you speak. Where does that come from? Look, I, I I'm a, it probably comes back a little bit to the that, that, that discussion we had about David Coles, where yeah. you know, it's a bit like you, know, you, you put your heart and soul into this. I mean, I'm... Uh, I obviously, I, I'm South Australian. I grew up in South Australia, but I was very blessed to be able to come and, and move into Victoria in the late 1990s and uh, and work with a group of people that I've become, uh, quite frankly, very, very close friends with. I think that you, know, you can certainly treat the um, the Victorian breeding community as clients, but I could have, honestly have to say that they are friends. They're a, a wonderful group of people. I have great pleasure in mixing with them socially. Um, whenever we get a chance to do inspections on farms, we try and try and incorporate into that uh, lunches and dinners where we can all sit around and, and chew the fat and solve the problems of the world. And I think probably as much as anything else, this industry, Ben, is it's it's a people industry. We have one common denominator being the thoroughbred horse, but it's yeah. very much a people industry. And I think for me, the uh, the people that I've been blessed to meet um, and the people that I've become blessed to be friends with has probably probably been one of it. And, and the fact that I'm living here in Victoria, um, I, I um, unashamedly sit back and, and, and could couldn't wish anybody any better than I can here. I love, I love the, um, love seeing it when a Victorian vendor has some real success. And you talk about Victoria, but you've worked all over Australia. Where has been the most enjoyable or interesting place to work, and why? I think every one of them has been interesting. Um, obviously, I, I enjoyed my time in in South Australia, and I was there for a long, long time. Um, I had a great stint over in WA, where I managed Goodwood Bloodstock. I spent some time up in Queensland uh, managing the the bloodstock interests of QBBS. Uh, clearly, under my reign with uh, with here with uh, with England, so I spent a lot of time uh, in Sydney but I'd have to say that unquestionably my my favorite my most enjoyable has been uh, with Inglis and here in Victoria I've loved every single minute of that part of it Ben are there any are there any um, trends you're noticing across the market 
And has COVID been an influencing factor at all, do you feel? Well, COVID has, uh, COVID has made us um, become more adaptable. I think that we'd, we'd all gone down a certain path. We all knew that what the program was going to be when it came to, um, yeah, you conclude your, your yearling sales series in uh, in in April um, or May, those sort of date times. Then from the, the 1st of July, you're, at, you're out on farms doing yearling inspections. You would go through the process of inspecting yearlings, selecting a catalogue to right through to Christmas time. Catalogues uh, come out. And, and then from the 1st of January, you're into the sales series. This last 12 months has taught us that we have to be far more adaptable. We've had to uh, be careful and clever about how we got around and did the inspections to select the catalogues. We've had to go through the processes of a sale such as Easter being um, a, 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 a virtual auction which was a, a real challenge for everybody. So I've had to adapt to that. We've had to have uh, our buyers and our vendors adapt to it. So that's been quite a, a, a challenge, but I think it showed that how resilient this industry is with, with the market being as strong as it is, even as we sit here now, we've still got COVID restrictions. We've got a, a yearling sale coming up this weekend and we've got signs up everywhere. We've got, um, we're, we're obviously encouraging distancing. We've got masks on. Uh, when it comes to the auditorium, which is uh, a very important part of the Melbourne sales ring, the Oakland's auditorium, we've got limitations as to how we can, how, how many people we can have in the auditorium and how we're going about that process of, of keeping them distanced. So there's been all of those challenges, but I think what it has proven to everybody is that in absolute adversity that's come down with COVID, the thoroughbred industry has been able to be incredibly resilient from our, from our racing right through to our breeding and to our sales. I think it's testimony to the application of every member of the of the thoroughbred industry in Australia that's been as successful as it has been. I was up at the Magic Millions at the Gold Coast in January, for example, and even though COVID's been a different situation up there in Queensland, um, it does show you're right, the resilience, and it definitely... If people all band together and work together, things can happen. Indeed, look, we, uh, I, we certainly had a massive sale, a phenomenal sale with Classic Sale in Sydney. And again, it was it, we were all having to be very, very cautious and careful about we, the way that we go about it. But again, what everybody has become so obvious with is their respect for other people. Um, we, we know that the, the broader community um, has been quite blessed in Australia that we haven't had the, uh, the, the, the spread of the, of the virus as other countries have. But that's probably as much because we've been as vigilant as we have been with, uh, with distancing. And look, Classic was terrific. Um, certainly the Gold Coast was terrific. New Zealand had to go through a very tough time with their sales because the Australian market was unable to, to participate in attendance but participated online and they had a good sale. Subsequent sales right around the land have been very good. So I, I think it's been it's been quite incredible, the uh, the attitude of the of the people. They like um, the people make the horse racing industry. So do you feel like that's the thing you'll miss most about working in English and more specifically in the wider racing and bloodstock industry? I think I'm going to miss the people. Look, I suppose yeah. I don't intend to uh, to go home and grow tomatoes. I've said that a few times. Yeah. But I don't intend to go home and grow tomatoes for the rest of my life. Um, I just want to be able to take more time to spend with, with my wife wife and my kids, my grandchildren, which will be a lot of fun. And to just whilst we can't travel internationally at this stage, I would love to be able to, to travel more around Australia and have a little bit more of a look around there with my wife, which will be great. But at the same time, I don't intend to uh, to, to walk away from the industry. I would like to think that I've got some, some great friends and great clients that I could try and assist in some way. Um, I suppose over 44 years, you, you do pick up a bit of knowledge. Um, I do recall having a conversation, if I can turn the clock back again, 40 odd years, um, I remember somebody asking Colin Hayes, the great, late, great Colin Hayes as a trainer, um, how much he thought he knew about the thoroughbred industry. And he said, I've been doing this for nearly 60 years now. And he said, I think I'm probably up to about 5%. So what it is, is that um, it, it takes a long time to learn this business. There's always something new to learn. So I want to keep learning as much as I possibly can and, and hopefully be able to share some of my experiences and some of my knowledge with, uh, with younger people that are coming into the industry. So I'll be working with the people as much as I possibly can, Ben. Just back on the premier side, is there any particular lot or um, particular studs draft that you've, you've seen you're like, wow, I'm, I'm really excited to see this go through the ring? Look, I, I, I do think that there are – well, I think we, first of all, we all get our favourites, and I've got a couple of favourite horses um, that I've seen so far, but I actually – there's still, still some of the uh, the lots that have come in from, from South Australia and from New South Wales that I've not yet had the privilege of looking at because we, we didn't do those inspections. They were done by our interstate – staff. Yep. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing all of those. Um, the drafts that have come down, look, the some of the farms, you know, farms like like Maluka and Blue Gum, uh, Spring Mount, that, that's 
sell exclusively in Melbourne, I think uh, I, I really appreciate their terrific attention to uh, to the Melbourne Premier Sale. But then we've got just about every major breeder in in uh, in Australia, quite frankly. And now we've got farms like Waikato and, and Cambridge and a number of other great clients from New Zealand supporting the sale. So look, I don't think there's probably any individual drafts that I could um, happily sort of um, identify as being stars. I just think that this is a really good batch of horses. I think that down the track, um, we will be able to look back on the 2021 version of, of Melbourne Premier and identify horses that are graduates that are that are really high quality race horses and um, look it's uh, again uh, yeah, I think that the the 90 90 percent clearance rate will be very important to me or close to 90 percent clearance rate but I've no doubt that um, and I'll look this part I will look forward to, to chasing down is um, seeing the success of these horses from um, from their two-year-old days in uh, in September October November of, uh, of 2021 right through to their older careers in 2022 2023 etc so there'll be some really good race horses come out this last uh, Simon, away from Budstock Consulting and Auctioneering, what does our uh, life look like for Simon Vivian? Life, um, look, I, I, I love my footy, so I'll be. I'm a, I'm a very avid. Adelaide Crows fan, so I, I love my football, I love my cricket. Um, I certainly, as I said before, I'd like to do a lot of travelling uh, around Australia, and probably as much of that by car because I think you get a great way of looking at things. I just want to be able to uh, to breathe some breathe some fresh air, Ben. Um, enjoy life, um, get to some of the sports that I haven't been able to get to for a while. As I said, yeah, the, the football, the cricket, get back to the races and be able to walk around uh, and just be able to chat to people and things like that. So look, I think it's um, um, God God willing that there's uh, there's continued good health. And, and myself, my wife and my family are able to uh, to enjoy it. And I'm very much looking forward to just having a bit more time to spend with all of them. Thanks very much for joining me today, Simon, giving me an, in, an, an insight into your career, the upcoming Melbourne Premier Asylum. What's what you're looking forward to in retirement? Really appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Really appreciate your interest. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you.